One condition that we hear uh, a lot about here at Mastering Diabetes because it's so connected to insulin resistance is PCOS. So talk to us how that is related to this whole hormone symphony. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when there's, there's, there's more and more people suffering from PCOS and essentially it's rooted in insulin resistance. And what you might notice with PCOS is that you would have potentially less frequent periods. Uh, you may also notice uh, increased body hair, um, and it's also potentially um, associated with increased uh, propensity to weight gain as well. And one of the interesting things that I discovered learning more about hormones and how they affect our bodies is that people who suffer from polycystic ovaries tend to have um, more receptors in their body for advanced glycation end products or ages. Um, I hope f some of your audience might be familiar with ages. Um, Elaborate a little bit on those, please. Okay, so essentially they are, they are proteins with sugar attached to them and they're biomarkers of aging inside the body. And they are basically, they can increase oxidative stress within the body. And uh, people who have PCOS have more receptors for these things and they tend to be um, present in meat and cheese and fried eggs and butter and junk food and other ultra processed foods. And so it's postulated that people who have PCOS tend to be more susceptible to the effects of these advanced glycation end products or ages. And that's something to be aware of. If you've got polycystic ovaries, um, ideally you'd aim for a healthy weight, but if that's not possible, then just focusing on the simple um, lifestyle things that, that we're going to be talking about in today's seminar, like eating whole foods, eating minimally processed foods, um, eating whole, you know, plant foods, uh, getting um, good night's sleep, moving your body, getting your lymphatic system working. All these things will actually reduce uh, your susceptibility to the effects of ages in the body and therefore also improve things like your immune health and all the other hormones that are associated with hormonal balance. So don't be disheartened um, if you're struggling with your weight uh, and you have PCOS. Obviously, the goal will be to improve your cycle by, in some cases, reducing your weight. But don't worry if you haven't got there yet. If you just focus on the whole foods and the good sleep and the exercise, then that will reduce your um, susceptibility to the effect of these ages. It's very important. Very important. OK, now another condition that we are quite familiar with here at Mastering Diabetes and, and passionate to talk about um, is endometriosis and also fibroids. So endometriosis, I know, is impacting so many people and they are not told. Like the process of getting diagnosed is, is really uh, a big issue right now. So tell us what is endometriosis, how is it related to this hormone conversation, and, and also talk to us about fibroids. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, there's so much I could say, but basically... I also just actually wanted to briefly let you know, there was a study that I wanted to share, which I forgot to mention just now about PCOS. And they did a study on women who had it and they gave them um, the same amount of calories, the same amount of uh, macronutrients, fats and carbohydrates. But they had one group of women having um, uh, soy protein and the other group of women having animal protein where with all the other macronutrients and calories the same. And what they noticed in these women who were suffering from PCOS during this trial was that those who had the soy protein versus the animal protein had reduced weight, um, improved waist circumference, uh, better insulin um, scores, better blood uh, glucose scores and better triglycerides. So I thought that Doing was great really... across the board there. Dr. <laughs> yeah, Newman. yeah, pretty much, I think. So I, I just thought it was really interesting to share that because like sometimes people think, oh, I have to, it's all about weight loss. And yes, of course, it, sometimes that will be important. But actually, the quality of what you're eating and the constituents of what you're eating can make huge difference, you know, to, to your overall outcome. So don't be disheartened. So anyway, um, endometriosis. So essentially, this is a condition of estrogen excess as well. Um but it has different effects on the body. Uh, there are certain cells, I mentioned those cells earlier that line the womb, the endometrial lining. That's what comes away with each monthly period. Uh, unfortunately, in some women, those cells can collect in other parts of the pelvis. 
And in fact, not just the pelvis, there have been case reports of these endometrial cells ending up in all sorts of places, including even the lungs. And what happens then when your uh, hormones are controlling your monthly cycle, you will have your bleed, your period, and those endometrial lining cells will bleed wherever they are. So most of them are inside the womb where they should be. But when you suffer with endometriosis, there are also many of these cells in other places and they will also bleed at the same time, which causes irritation within the pelvis. So it may have complications such as um, problems with fertility, uh, problems with abdominal pain, painful sex, because uh, what's happening is those um, th the irritation causes the parts of um, the pelvis to somehow stick together uh, called adhesions and so you can get adhesions between bladder and bowel you can get adhesions between the bowel and the womb um, and that can then also lead to increased risk of abdominal pain and may even require surgery so it's a really difficult condition you mentioned earlier that it can be a hard road because it's so difficult it's not that well known still yeah. amongst some doctors, but also it's really difficult to diagnose because unless you actually look, you won't know that somebody has endometriosis. And so exactly. the treatment is the diagnosis. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, having a laparoscope and looking inside, you can see, oh, yes, I can see these adhesions. I can see these so-called chocolate cysts where you've had endometrial cells bleeding on the actual ovaries, for example. Uh, and you can see it. You think, yep, yeah, there it is. I'll, I'll zap those cells and hopefully that will stop the bleeding and, and you know, they'll feel much better. But of course, you, you do get signs. So it can take up to 12 years on average for a woman to get that diagnosis. You imagine having periods and pain and all these symptoms for, for 12 years before you finally get a diagnosis. It's really, really demoralizing. But you know, there are signs I look for. And if you are suffering from extreme period pains to the point that it's causing you to vomit, uh, you're having to take sick days off work, um, if it's painful to have sex, you must see your doctor and ask them to think about endometriosis because this is something that is a medical condition and it's not just, oh, well, you know, you just got your period and that's that's what the problem is. Um, and so that's that's endometriosis. It, it's it's not necessarily easy to treat, but I I have to tell people there is hope because there is no doubt in my mind, based on the studies I've read and some of the people that I've treated, that diet can play its part in improving endometriosis. There was a really interesting follow up study. Uh, it was done over twenty years, and the women were. Uh, diagnosed via laparoscopy, you know, laparoscopy, that they definitely did have endometriosis and they were followed up for 20 years. And what they found in the study was that um, worsening endometriosis, so more severe cases, were associated with uh, the consumption of both red meat and chicken. And this is a really interesting association. It doesn't prove causation, but they definitely found that the more red meat and chicken that the women consumed, uh, the more severe the endometriosis that they were observed to have. And the researchers postulated that that might be because of heme iron, which is present in animal products uh, and is potentially, you know, we know the, that heme iron is more oxidizing in the body and it comes from animal products. So that, that was their hypothesis. Um, but we also know, interestingly, going back to what I said earlier about plastics exposures, Phthalates in food, um, the highest um, concentration of phthalates in food in the UK has been found to be fish and the highest concentration of phthalates in the US has been found to be chicken. And so if you have this information and you have endometriosis, it may well be worth doing some simple protein swaps. So you'd swap over to a plant based protein, you know, chickpeas, lentils, tofu, beans, and you may find then that it may have an impact on the severity of your symptoms, potentially. Yeah, and I'm so glad you're delivering hope on this topic and sharing these evidence-based resources. And I think demoralizing is, is an accurate word because what happens is women are experiencing these symptoms and they're going to doctor after doctor and being told, oh, it's in your, it's in your head it's this, it's that. And it's like, no, like there is this tissue in my body that is actually causing these problems. And 
and doctors just don't know about it. So I'm glad you're speaking up about it. I'm glad you're sharing research um, and, and providing options. So thank you for doing that. So how about fibroids? Oh, yes. Okay. So fibroids, again, really interesting. Um, fibroids are another condition that, that, um, that are associated with estrogen excess. And what happens with fibroids is that you get these lumps forming within the womb. And these lumps are not cancerous, but they can grow quite large. And we, we know that they're, that, that they're connected to estrogen because uh, women who have their periods start earlier tend to be at higher risk of fibroids. And fibroids shrink after the menopause. So we know that they are associated with estrogen exposures. Um, now, I have seen many patients, but also I would love more research into this, um, that who have improved their symptoms and uh, of, fi of fibroids through diet. When your fibroids are within the womb lining, kind of inside the cavity of the womb, that's when you have a higher risk of um, of heavy, painful periods. When they're in other places, so sometimes they're on the outside, sometimes they're at the top, sometimes they're you know around the back. It doesn't really tend to have as much of an effect on the heaviness of your of your bleed. But of course, when they get really big, they can actually become um, like palpable from the outside of the tummy. You know, sometimes you know, I, I had one patient that I examined recently who had been having suffering from fibroids for many years, and they got so large that it, her womb actually felt like she was about 20 weeks pregnant because it was so full of fibroids. Um, so it definitely does have that physical effect. But also, if the fibroids happen to be within the womb, then they can have you know, an effect with, with causing your periods to be much heavier and, and therefore also potentially much more painful. Um, Diet-wise, again, because we know we've talked about the three things that can really help is reducing our estrogen exposures. So if we have excess weight, that can potentially be an estrogen, estrogenic thing. Why is that? Because our fat cells are actually endocrine organs. The fat is an endocrine organ. It actually releases hormones um, and it can release estrogen into the system. So if we have less of those, um, or at least if the fat cells are smaller, then they produce less estrogen. Therefore, you're less likely to have as many issues with fibroid. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't always correlate, but it definitely can help. Same with the plastics exposures. Same with avoidance of constipation. Those are the three things that I think are really important for, for those um, who suffer from these kind of hormone related things to remember. Interestingly, there are studies to suggest that fibroids are also associated with, uh, I think it was beef and ham consumption as well. So again, thinking about some healthy protein swaps might be really beneficial. Okay, we're seeing some consistent themes here. 